Everyone is aware that the COVID-19 pandemic caused nearly every employer, regardless of size and sector, to urgently switch employee operations to a dynamics of remote stroke home work. So as things are now starting to, to lift, the fog is starting to clear, we're all kind of having these conversations about how we want to work going forward, the good, the bad and the ugly of what was before and what we've been through in the last year in terms of our productivity, our mental health and everything in between. So with that in mind, we're, we're welcoming uh, Chris Hurd along today. And Chris, for those who don't know, is the founder and CEO of um, an incredible growing startup. We'll talk about that in a second. First Base HQ. So first of all, Chris, welcome. How are you doing? Hey, Nick. Uh, I'm good. How are you? Um, that's a big question. Um, we mentioned this just in the waiting room before. I think that's the biggest question you can ask someone. So right now, I'm going to tell you that today, I'm okay. I'm glad everyone's here and it's all going well so far. Um, we're partnering with Startup Ground Scotland for this event and in Startup Ground uh, Fireside Track uh, style. I'd love to just know a little bit about First Base, you and your story. What is the why behind the company? Yeah, let's, let's start with the why because we never actually meant to build a business that we did. We started out building a financial technology company around two years ago. Um, and at that point, we, we, we decided we had to be remote for a huge number of reasons. Um, but most importantly to me, it, it was a bridge to a higher quality of life. Um, I'd miss my daughter walking, laughing, talking for the first time. Um, and I didn't really want her to grow up not knowing her dad, which was, was my perception of what was going to occur. So I want to spend more time with her. I want to spend more time with my family. I want to spend more time doing the things that made me happy while continuing to do great work and remote work was, was the obvious conclusion that we drew from that. Um, and then as we started getting, getting that company set up, we hired a few people. We realized how difficult it was to operate as a remote company. It's expensive to get people things. It's time consuming. Stuff doesn't turn up. People leave. It's impossible to get the equipment back. And yeah, for us, we just saw that as a problem that we had to solve. And eventually, um, we focused on solving not just for ourselves, but for larger companies um, in general. Um, we pivoted to that full time in September 2019. Since then, we've raised $15 million. Um, we're already working with some of the biggest companies on the planet. I'm sure a lot of you use products and services that, that many of these companies use. And yeah, just really trying to enable and empower um, remote work to happen. Um, you mentioned the raise there, and you were in the news recently raise, raising 13 million for First Base HQ, which is a ridiculous raise for any company, let alone a, a growing Scottish company. Congratulations on that. Um, for, for people that have been following you on Twitter in the last year, I mean, you've been in your element, right? I mean, this is, I was talking to um, the CEO of Flow the other day that do deliveries for, for pharmacies. And I think, you know, you're another example of a company that couldn't have predicted the global pandemic, but were kind of ready to get out there and support people. You know, how was that for you in the last year, personally? Yeah, I, I think that's spot on. I think it was, it was a trend that was really happening far quicker than most people realize. Um, I think in retrospect, you look back, look at the US market and the EU market, there were already 13 million people working full-time remote prior to the pandemic across those regions. So it was way bigger than people realized. I think the difference then was that it was something being driven by talent. Um, so it was highly skilled and sought after people being recruited by companies and saying, well, the only way I'm going to come and work for you is if you let me work remotely. Um, and I think the difference now is companies now know remote work works and they're going to be the ones driving this. And yeah, I think in terms of timing, we, we just happen to be building a product that operated in that domain and companies obviously were struggling with a lot of the things that we were describing. I love that. And, um, you know, full disclosure, AAI has been remote for the last 11 years. So we're kind of already on the boat. I'm going to try and bring in some research for the people who do love the office and, and want to go back to that. So we've got a bit of nuance in this conversation. Um, but what we're going to be doing is, is basing this conversation around two amazing Twitter threads. The first one that you dropped in April got a ton of engagement, a ton of attention. And this second one here that you dropped just uh, just the other week, which is also doing very well, all around the fate of the workplace. 
We're going to tackle some of the themes that are within those threads. Uh, Joy is going to drop the, the threads into the chat, but we'll also send around a wrap-up email so people can dig into the stuff that we don't talk about. And we're going to cover some of those themes, leaving about 15 minutes today for Q&A from the audience. So people, please do get involved in the chat. Let us know how you're feeling, what's coming next for you. Does that sound okay, Chris? Sounds good to me. Okay. So... The office exodus, this was trending on LinkedIn the other day that um, commercial units in London and across the UK are being turned into flats, while at the same time, Google is kind of starting to reverse their, their policies on processes around remote work and calling people back into the office and setting limitations on remote and homework and how people are doing, doing it. So first of all, let's just get straight into it. Chris, why do you think the office, as we know it, is now dead? Yeah, I mean, to start on the Google bit, Google actually had a, a, a massive walk back. Um, they announced three or four weeks ago, we're almost entirely going to go back to the office. Um, and their engineers basically said, well, you might go back to the office, but we're not. We're going to go and work for Facebook and Reddit and all these other companies. So I think what you're seeing happen is workers in particular are realizing that in a knowledge-based economy, the company is the people, right? If you don't have great people, you don't have a company. And, and I think Google and a lot of these other companies will see the same thing. So I think the first tweet, what that alludes to is HQs are finished, okay? So that doesn't mean that physical spaces won't exist. It just means that these egotistical monuments to a company's prior success, which are just incredibly expensive, nobody really enjoys spending any time there, they're going to be slashed. It, it just doesn't make any sense to pay ten to $50,000 per worker um, if you can let people work remotely. So that's where that is. And I think the second piece, a little more bias in this one, I think clearly companies that talk to me do so because they are, are looking for a solution. Um, but yeah, I think the number is going to be far higher than people think with respect to going fully remote um, and cutting the office entirely. So full disclosure, I'm going to be I'm going to be 36 next week, and I have not worked a day in an office in my life, and I'm weirdly proud of that. But I know um, around that there are lots of people that do love the office. They love putting on their they love putting on their their costume. They love going to the set. It's almost like a movie set where you go in and play a role. Um, I, I feel like a lot of people have missed that dynamic, and certainly the pandemic caused a tidal wave of, of emotions and, and everything for everyone. But what, what, what are we looking at now in terms of this idea of hybrid? Because people are saying, right, we're going to offer our people hybrid work, but the, the dimensions around that are never quite clear. What's your opinion on this, I, this, this buzzword of hybrid at the moment, Chris? Yeah, I, I, th I think hybrid is a nonsense. I don't think hybrid work actually exists. Um, and the reason for that is if, if I ask you what does hybrid remote mean and I ask the 80 other participants here, almost everyone's going to give a different answer. Is it four days, in office, four days a week in the office? Is it one day a quarter in the office? Is it somewhere between those two points? So actually, I don't think it's that helpful to talk about being remote, hybrid or office based. I think the way that I like to think about it, and this is certainly what we suggest with the people we, we speak to, is a company is either office first or it's remote first. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't spend time in either location. It means the type of organization and what it's optimized for. So office first organizations are optimized for offices. Um, that is the, the predominant situation. And in those companies, you end up with this really dangerous situation where potentially two classes of workers emerge. You've got people in the offices who have face time with management. They're able to progress more quickly. And that's seen as being the place that you have to be in to, to progress. And I think that changes when you start to look at it through the, the prism of being remote first. Um, and there's, there's a lot of like really small changes that happen there. Like everyone, for example, has been on a video call where multiple people are in an office and then two or three people are dialed in. Now, that should never happen. In an office first company, that is what happens. In a remote first company, everyone dials in in their own piece of equipment. So there's, the, there's this equality in terms of participation. So that's one example of the two. The, the second I would use is typically where leadership is determines the type of the organization. So if leadership's in the office full-time, de facto, you are an office-first company. 
if they're distributed, you're a remote first company. And I think you've seen a lot of interesting things happen in this space over the last few months. Um, Coinbase is perhaps the most um, interesting example of that, where they literally cut their HQ because they didn't want that to be the, the place that everyone sort of gravitated towards. Um, I, you mentioned something there about the, the kind of dynamic of some people are in a meeting, some people are on calls. And you mentioned the, the kind of natural favoritism that you might show if you're a leader and you've called a meeting and people turn up to the office. You know, this, this is not something that talent should be subjected to in terms of missing out on opportunities in FaceTime. So we're going to get into a bit later about leadership responsibilities. Have we got any advice that people who want to offer the people that want to come back to the office that while also recognizing that people work, some people work better with flexible and remote working. How can they structure that dynamic without making people feel left out? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the reality is actually the, the alternative, which is, I mean, we, we were speaking about this before the call, 90 to 95% of people never want to work in an office again full time. It's really hard for that 5 or 3% of people who do want to go back to an office full time to appreciate that. So I think the answer is like, give, give people what they want. Um, if someone wants an office space, fine, <laughs> give them a co-working space. Um, that doesn't mean that you need to force other people to, to come into the office then. If, if that person wants an office, give them it. If they don't, if, if the other people don't, then you've got to give them what they want as well. Otherwise, you're forcing things on, on certain groups of people and you end up with the same inequality, which I think is the big problem here. That's it. And um, you've done a ton of research. There's lots of stuff going on, but let's just see how people are feeling in the chat today. That's right. It's a classic Zoom poll. So people tell me what you're feeling. Working from home, working from anywhere, stroke remotely, back to the office full time, um, some kind of hybrid. And I'm not sure yet, Nick, that's why I'm here. So let's just give people a second for that. This Off tweet was just crushed. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even close. So... The tweet we've got on screen about the office not being a priority, you're, you're bringing up the, um, the idea of, you know, people are saying, I need that human connection, I need that connectivity, I need those relationships. And we'll get into that a bit later with, when we talk about remote fear. But I don't think people haven't recognised that your employer selecting who you spend most of your life with is not really, when did this become part of, how we do the job that we've been hired to do, to be surrounded by all these people in the office. Um, I, I don't know if people have ever, have ever really noticed that. I certainly haven't, having never worked in an office, but working in code base, I've always found that bumping into people from different companies with different points of view, with different workloads has actually always been much better for my productivity and my sense of value in the job that I'm doing. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think it's it's this weird thing because people get really upset when you you say it. And I, I, I try to be quite sensitive around this because I think what you're saying is absolutely right. Um, your employer's HR team selecting who you spend most time with isn't a good thing. Um, you end up with these shallow, superficial relationships. And and before I go on, like it, it's... Obviously, people meet people in the office that they end up remaining friends with for life. That's not, I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but it's not a very high percentage of people um, as in overall inside the company. So I think you just end up in this relationship where you, you, you build shallow, superficial relationships. And by that, I mean, we go in on a Monday morning and you say, oh, did you see the sporting event that happened at the weekend? Did you Like, nobody really cares, right? We're not building a relationship. We're just like, chatting chatting the breeze and we're, we're passing the time and actually what we're doing is padding out an eight hour day to make it more bearable <laughs> like that let's let's call a spade a spade here that's exactly what we're doing nobody's productive for eight hours a day it's impossible but it makes it makes our our managers feel better if we at least look like we're sat in our seat even if we're not doing any work um and i think for me like the important part to realize here is a lot of people are looking at this as remote work today right it, this is pandemic remote work. This, this is not normal remote work. There are lockdowns. There are homeschooling. You can't hug your parents. You're not going out for dinner with friends. You're not traveling. This is the worst possible version of remote work. Now, actually, I, I was incredibly scared about the effect this would have on people. I thought people are going to hate remote work. Why would you want to work remotely after not getting 
any of the benefits. Um, <laughs> but actually, that, that hasn't been the case. I think people realize that, oh, like I don't have to commute every day. I can be more flexible on my day. I can set my schedule. I can work when I want. I can still have time with my kids or my family or I can cook better. I can exercise more. And you start to layer on top all these intangible things. Um, the social part never comes into it because actually remote is more social than um, working in an office and you get to choose the people, um, at least in my experience. That's it. And yeah, when, it, when there's not a global pandemic happening and we're not allowed to, to go out, hugs are coming up. I'm quite excited about some hugs with some strangers, so watch out. Um, you've mentioned the future of work here and it, you've you've beautifully demonstrated with some colourful emojis some of the benefits of how work and life should actually be balanced. And we're talking about a higher quality of life here. I think that's been reflected in the poll results. Some people want to stay working from home. Um, I know I know some people have just become really, really uh, comfortable with the, how they work and the accommodations they have in their home. People with disabilities have got more energy and, and, and people with, with childcare responsibilities can work more flexibly. Um, lots of people wanting to work remotely. Nobody wanting to go back on the office full time. Um, we might have created a bit of an echo chamber here with how we've been promoting this event. And a couple of people still not decided. So let's um, let's get into this. You said while you do your best work ever there, and I love that. Do, I mean, all the all the surveys, all the data shows that people are more productive when they don't have to go to. I think you called it the distraction factory once. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah. A, di a distraction factory adult kids club, actually, Nick. Um, yeah, look, I, I think if you asked every individual here, do they care about the future of work? Like, I, I don't care about the future of work. I, I don't really spend that much time thinking about working. Now, you come to me and you describe it as the future of living. Okay, now I'm engaged. Like, what are you talking about there? We're talking about all this stuff. And I think what you're speaking about with respect to D, D, E, and I, and, and all the, those, those topics, like it's a no brainer from that perspective as well. Like this, this isn't just about creating an environment that's great for one group of people. Um, it enables louder, more gregarious people to accelerate their careers more quickly. And I look at it and I say, well, actually, like I'd, I'd really like to build better organizations for more people. Um, how can we uh, democratize access to opportunity? How can we help every individual do the best work that they've ever done in their lives? So rather than designing work to the collective, which is what the office is, we design work to the individual and let them personalize it to their own requirements. And in that sense, you, you can now not just hire the best person you can afford in a 30 mile radius, you can hire the best person on the planet, whether they're, I don't know, single parents or they're caring for, for family members, or they've got, to your point, health conditions or impairments that make working in an office really uncomfortable, difficult, if not impossible. So there's just a whole host of things which, yeah, we come back to work, but to me, it's actually living. How can we, we empower people to have a higher quality of life? Um, you do that through work, and then obviously all the indirect benefits come. I love that. And certainly what you mentioned there about equality of opportunity to work chimes in very well with AAI's values. And we'll talk about remote talent in a second. I want to show you this, though. Um, you know, offices are getting nervous. They're suggesting people take a pay cut to work from home or work less or get an extra um, 21K to come into the office. Like, what is, what is going on here? People are, are starting to sweat in their ivory towers, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've I've heard this from a lot of people. Is the hottest garbage I have ever seen in my entire life. Like, the there's just so many. And, and actually, I got asked if I if I would go on to ITV a while ago to to have a debate on this with a certain somebody who is no longer there. Um, and and my question my question was like, why is it okay to discriminate against workers? Like, replace remote worker with any other group and you're in a very bad place. Like, why is it okay to now say we're going to pay a remote worker less? Like, while, while simultaneously, by the way, paying for office space. Like, not only are we going to pay you a higher salary, but we're also going to pay for an office space for you. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And I think actually you start to look at the implications of this and you say companies, companies that refuse to, to bend to this, um, what happened to every company that never embraced the internet? 
What happened to every company that didn't embrace software? What happened to every company that didn't do X, Y, and Z? And you say, well, and they, they turned down innovation and ultimately killed the business. And I think we're going to see the same thing here. Companies that refuse to work remotely, refuse to hire remotely, their competitors will. Um, and their competitors will steal your best people. And then your business will die. <laughs> the fate of the workplace in full effect there. So let's look at your data here. This is, um, is this anecdotal or is this more data driven in terms of what you've been hearing? I mean, certainly the people that come to you directly obviously want to engage with remote work, but is this the kind of litmus test of, of the kind of social zeitgeist in the circles that you're moving in? Um, I, I would say this is, you're starting to see this be more than anecdotal. I, I don't know if you've seen nationwide survey results. That was, um, oh. that was frightening. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd have some serious questions if I'm JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs trying to go back to the, the office just now. And I think none of the bankers want to go back. Um, so yeah, I, I think, look, consistently, I think I've been three or six months ahead of this. I think a lot of what I'm hearing eventually comes out in the press. Um, and I think that's a similar situation there. I think the stats, I, I, I actually think this is heavy, uh, as in I, I'm not sure it's as high as 6.5 people in 10 want to work from home, work remotely all the time. Um, but I suspect it's somewhere between four, four and six. So let's um, talk about why people might be afraid of remote work then. Um, you've got this slide about remote fear and it's, it's all about the quality of work communication, this collaboration, the water cooler chat, and you've identified that these are probably excuses. Um, yeah, bit, I, I mean, it's like middle management across the calls in a second. <laughs> it's, it's a question, that, like, a, it's, a, it's one that I, I don't really like talking about because it's, I think it's, a, it's better answered with a question, which is, what's the biggest problem you've ever seen solved at a water cooler? <laughs> and so I, look, I've, I've pulled some stuff from from LinkedIn, I've been, I've been going deep on the research here just to get a flavor of what people are actually scared about. So this first guy is a sales guy who um, is talking about connection and relationships. Um, and then the second person is talking about the comfort of working from home, the lack of distractions, the lack of commute. And, but she likes to go to the office because of the hard stop and the boundaries around her actual workload. You know, these are all things that people are considering at the moment. And I think it, it plays into what you said about a leadership responsibility. How have leaders kept their, their team productive, but also made sure that they're shutting off during the pandemic? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I, whenever I read this stuff, I just feel like it's middle management gaslighting workers into feeling like they should be returning. And I, I think it's, 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 it's terrible. Um, you look at a daily commute, the average commute today is, I think, an hour a day. Um, but that's the average. A lot of people are commuting two hours a day, three hours a day, four hours a day. And you start to total that up and you say, geez, should, should people really be wasting 15% of their day commuting? Like, is that reasonable? And actually, like, what, what, what is worth commuting for? Like, I'm quite happy to concede certain things are better in person. Okay, I'll, I'll concede... Um, communication is better than in person okay how much better is it is it 50 it's not 50 percent better right it's maybe it's not 20 percent better maybe it's 10 percent better if you've never met someone before but if you have met someone before i it can be as low as one percent better so at that point like you're weighing up the the costs and benefits of having to commute every day and i think it's just something where the the reality is it's not something that needs to happen every day but I think people do still need to come together physically. Is it one day a week? Is it two days a week? Is it one day a month? Is it 10 days a month? I think that's what is unclear. And I think that's, that's what people are maybe scared of. That, that's the remote fear. We don't know um, what cadence we should come together at in order to maximize the benefits, which I think are often intangible and pretty difficult to measure against. Absolutely. And that's reflected here when we're talking about people's productivity, their focus, they're almost being at the, at the victim of other people's working styles. Um, I was speaking to someone the other day who said that nobody went out for lunch in their tiny office. They all brought their lunch to work and sat around the desk. And if you went out for lunch, you were some kind of, uh, of turncoat for the company culture. 
And, you know, just the nine to five, these are the times that you have to perform in and you have to be available. Um, we've got someone here talking about the questions about safety, about vaccinations. What is the point of going into physical meetings or going to the office if we can't have meetings where people are because of social distancing, for example, and um, people talking about a spike in anxiety with the idea of even going back into that arena? Um, you know, people that are, are pulling their employees back into the workplace, what kind of messages should they be sending to people to reassure them about safety, but also to address mental health, which has been a huge concern in the last year. So there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot to unpack in this. And I think if you're an employer right now, you really need to be thinking carefully about what messages you put out from your people and maybe putting out surveys uh, to gauge that. But also, if you're a job seeker, you know, you, you're applying for jobs, the job market's recovering now, but you don't really know what situation you might be going into and, and how to address that at a job interview is quite scary as well, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would say that's absolutely true. I, I think the, the uncertainty around um, people feeling comfort in the situation they're facing is, is just not there, I think, because companies don't know what they're doing individuals don't know what they're doing and it's just this this cycle where we're, we're all trying to feel our way around in the dark to ultimately end up in a situation that we try to make as many people happy with as possible and it's that that's a very difficult balancing act um, in my opinion and i think we've got a long way to go until we get somewhere that, that a lot of people feel happy with now i've got something here about young people being more keen to go back to the office um I realize we're running slightly low on time, but this is essentially something which came out which says young people and lower earners and single people, single young people are keen to go back into the workplace. I'll share it in the wrap up email, but have you seen anything around this where it's more the higher earners over 45K that are looking for more remote work because they maybe feel that the, the young people feel like the office is a place to get ahead in their career? Um, I, I see a lot of old people telling me that young people want to go back to the office. I <laughs> haven't personally spoken to many young people who, who do. Now, I, I, I don't think, I, what I'm saying is, what I'm not saying is they don't. I, I think young people want to be in situations where they're around other people. So it may not necessarily mean that they want to escape the city, for example. Um, I think young people want to be in situations that are vibrant. There's, there's an active... I know, a social scene. Um, and I think like people are using getting back to the office as shorthand for that. Um, and it's the same question that you see where like people say, okay, well, how much do you want to work remotely? X days a week. And then they don't like ask the follow-up question is how many days do you want to go into the office? So the assumption is just, if I say three days, I now want to be in the office two days. I'm not sure that's what people are saying at all. They, they don't want to work from home three days, but they may want to work at coffee shops or um, wherever else. Um, and, and I think there's like a secondary part in here, which I often see with young people as well, which is, well, young people can't work remotely. Um, they're working in shared apartments. They're, they're, there's loneliness and isolation. And I, I think like that's, that's such a, a weird place to start the argument from. Um, why, why, are, why are they living in a shared apartment? Is it because they want to, or is it because that there's a high cost of living in cities and you need to live close enough to commute daily? Um, why are people living in cities on their own? Is it because they want to live in cities on their own? Or is it because they've got to move to large, expensive cities in chasing in, in, in search of opportunity? So there's a lot of situations. I've been through this. I've got a lot of friends that have been through this where you leave family and friends behind because you think you need to go to the big city to get the big job that pays the big bucks. And then you have no money left because your cost of living is so high. So I, look, I, I, I'm not saying that this isn't something that people want. I'm not saying it's not a problem, but I think actually the root cause is potentially the office and the um, implication of that rather than remote work being um, the issue people make it out to be with young people. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something I'm personally very passionate about. Um, I think it's reflected in AEI's values and how we work in trying to create opportunities that help graduates and, and people in Scotland find work and find opportunity here rather than feeling that they have to go do their time in London to get ahead in their career. And even this picture that they've chosen for this of these people with masks on the subway is making me sweat uh, in the pandemic here. I think it's, it's gross. So you've hit the nail on the head there. 
Um, I want to talk about culture and productivity because this kind of underlines a lot of the argument, doesn't it? And um, I love, I've been, I've been following you on LinkedIn as well. It's not just Twitter. I'm, I'm a, a multi-platform stalker, can I put? But this one here, I think, sums it up really well. To get back to work, what, what do you think your team have been doing in the last 15 months? And I think this goes, this ties in really well to your suggestions um, and, and predictions in terms of productivity. So if we look at output over time there, we're talking about tracking output, tracking achievement, tracking KPIs, maybe even using project management software to actually track activity rather than just people being visible, turning up, clocking in and out of the office. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, go into any office and the typical metric for tracking performance is like, did you sit in that seat for eight hours? <laughs> did you did you do your work? You know, and it's just not tangible. Um, that doesn't mean they they aren't measuring it in 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 ways like remote companies do. But yeah, I think for remote companies, it, it's it's really tangible. What what have you done for me versus how long have you worked? Um, that's certainly how we manage. Um, I think we've got a very clear path to where we're going, and I think the metrics that we use to track where we are in relation to that. Um, is, is relatively easy. Um, there are certain jobs where that isn't the case, but I think increasingly there are a lot of jo jobs where it is. Um, how much have you sold? How much? Um, how, ma how many tickets have you written off in the production roadmap? How many features have been pushed, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think people often use, well, the, well you, we can't measure that person's performance nonsense. I, for the most part, I would say 99 times out of 100, if you're um, a smart manager who's who's actually trying to measure stuff, you can. Um, people can measure what matters, and I think people are very good at like at making excuses not for measuring things. And if you're a leader who's not got a grip on how you, you track your team, you know you've got more organizational problems than where people are working. I would say, um, as I say, we'll we'll share these these tweets in our wrap up email so you can dig into this a bit more. Um, waiting two hours to travel to a meeting will end but then that's telling me it's time for, for questions but just tell me a little bit about this this rise of conferences and networking and quality interactions yeah I, I think this is I mean we, we've spent a lot of time speaking about human connection and, and I think clearly that's still incredibly important so just understanding how to best maximize that both internally, but also externally, which I think is often actually the more important part. Um, we, we need to figure out ways to do that. Um, I think we need, need new solutions to overcome a lot of the problems that we are facing. I think remote working isn't all um, sort of unicorns and, and, and good stuff. There are challenges. And I think there are a lot of companies trying to overcome some of these things. And yeah, I think for, for me, there's, there's, it's, it's not so much like remote versus the office. It's, it's quality of life versus wasting it, basically. And let's talk about um, asynchronous work, because this is something which pops up in your, in your tweets, and I had to, to look it up. But um, it's essentially synchronous is things that happen at the same time, synchronous, uh, like synchronous swimming, and asynchronous is things that don't happen at the same time. So workers have uh, a chance to complete tasks in their own time and their own timetable, and that may be very different of, to their colleagues. So this is, I mean, email, I think, is a great example of this. Email versus Slack or phone calls. You, know, you don't need an instantaneous response to an email. But people doing this in a remote setting, I mean, you're, you're hiring people across the world at the moment, so you've kind of had to adapt to this asynchronous work. Could you tell us a little bit about what you predict for this growing in the, in the, in the work? Yeah, and, and actually extending that, I, I think the question for me is like, we, we, we've, kind of in, we've kind of allowed our personal relationships to become super asynchronous. Um, we, we, we text, we, we use social media, um, but we don't have as many personal relationships with the people we care about most as we used to. Um, we don't have the, the hobbies and things that we used to. And I think my my belief is that actually we're, we're going to flip that because probably because of the pandemic, people want to, like we spoke about before, hug their parents, do things with the people they care about most. And I think asynchronous work is, is the way to do that. Um, not everything has to be done at the same time as your colleagues. Um, 
some things do clearly and and we'll we'll figure that out and they'll still be done that way but for the most part deep focused work is is what many office jobs are um and if you're not empowering individuals to do deep focused work um they're they're not really being that productive and I, I think a lot of a lot of people make excuses for this and they say well we need to be together because what about when i can go over and tap someone on the shoulder and the serendipitous blah 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 like okay like how many times have you actually seen that be the case like give me give me tangible examples and they'll say well not me but my friends brothers dogs sisters auntie was this at facebook and this is what happened and it's, it's just not what happens. <laughs> like pe people solve problems on walks away from the office or, or in showers or in really random places, typically in isolation where their brain's just left to, to run. I, I've seen very little, very few problems solved in like group situations. And yeah, I'm not saying people don't want synchronous time, but I, I think asynchronous just isn't leaned on enough and it's a real superpower of remote work. I love that. So we are running low on time. I want to talk about employment and talent and the future of work because this is what AAI does. Um, when we talk about access to talent, I think the, the boom of remote work in the pandemic has been a real leveler. If you're someone that lives in John O'Groats, but you're a programmer, you can now demand the same salary as someone down in London to work remotely. And I think that, that um, that's, that's only a good thing. If we think about... You mentioned in a knowledge-based economy where there is a war on talent, your company is your people. So listen to what your people want. Um, if they don't want to be have the ball and chain of the office, if they don't want to be married to that building and the commute, you should be able to trust them to do their work. Um, let's talk about the, the people who, who are trying to access work. So like we're, the pandemic's been horrible for women. There's been lots of studies um, about women taking on the role of a primary caregiver, even when they're working full time with their male partner in the house. Um, AAI just recently finished a project about women returning to the workplace after, after a career break and actually talking to the employers that were part of that project. They were much more responsive to, to flexible working hours halfway through the pandemic than they have been in previous iterations of that product, that project. So in the competition for talent, remote work is is really is really a blessing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean the the data on women is is horrific, um, and companies have really let themselves down here. And I think there's a real danger they let progress that has been happening over the last several years just recede and actually worsen. Um, and I think that that needs to be addressed very, very, very quickly. We're in a very bad place. Um, and they're, they're trying. It's just they're, they're not reacting quickly enough. And I think, yeah, I think re remote work is, is one answer to that. I think to your point, women have been obviously primary caregivers. They shoulder an unequal burden with, with respect to homeschooling, which we obviously all live through and, and all, all those things. Um, and, and I think empowering people with the flexibility to live the life they want while also still being able to work is incredibly important. Um, and I think every organization um, should, should take responsibility for that. We, we need people to be able to access opportunity. And I think by prescribing five days, four days, three days, however many days in an office makes that really difficult for certain groups of people. Um, I'd also highlight the other point that you made, which is around John O'Groats. And I, I think for me, like the opposite point is interesting, which is if I live anywhere in the world, like maybe I want to live on the Isle of Skye. Um, maybe I want to live in John O'Groats. So it should be a massive boon for places like Scotland who have some of the most beautiful scenery in the world. Um, and I think Scotland as a whole should be doing far more to attract great talent to 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 our shores we've seen it happen um there's a really interesting initiative in tulsa and oklahoma they're literally paying people ten thousand dollars to move to tulsa home oklahoma for a year um, a couple of our sales guys moved over to barbados for 12 months on um a remote visa and yeah look i've, I've spoken to a lot of people in scotland about this and i, I think we're, we're we're letting ourselves down we we more than anyone, have huge benefits that people love about the country. And I think it's it's something we should be leveraging far more, to be quite honest. 
Yeah, a bit of pressure there on the, the Scotland Can Do brand to help promote Scotland as the most entrepreneurial country in the world because we do have that quality of living. We do have great innovation hubs here and actually perhaps promoting that to the rest of the world is something we need to invest more time and money into. Um, quality of life is something we've discussed quite a lot in here, so I might just leave that. But, um, you know, I've, I've just signed up for, for kickboxing and jiu-jitsu at my local community centre, which I didn't even know was on my doorstep before the pandemic. You know, hobby, renaissance, people have been baking banana bread, and I often joke about, you know, sourdough and all that kind of stuff in the pandemic. But this time that people have had not commuting, not ironing shirts for the office, it's only going to pay dividends in, in their work-life balance moving forward, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of people tell me that people need human connection, and I couldn't agree more. Um, but I, I think what there's a real vacuum of in the modern world is deep relationships with people we share deep common bonds with. And that typically happens, like go back to the, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Initially, it was a church, and then it transitioned to being more around hobbies and then a number of other things. And this cult of the office, which has expanded exponentially to take up more and more time to maximize productivity, has made it really difficult for those personal relationships to happen. It makes it difficult to do the, the things you talk about, the clubs, the hobbies, the things that we love doing that make us happy, that let us spend time with people. Um, I, I think that's, that's the relationships people need. People don't need more um, shallow relationships in offices. They need more deep relationships with people they care about. That's it. And uh, we're going to send around a couple of, of reports around all this kind of stuff. But let's get into the Q&A because the chat's been going mad. I'd like to start with a question from Simon Fraser from Aberté University. Chris, have you seen any geographical social economic splits in the desire to go back to the office? Um, I, I mean, this would be more anecdotal. I, I think, look, we, we see a lot of data across um, call centers and things like that. There was a famous study that Stanford did years ago about productivity and health and well-being with people um, working in those situations um, and it's it's a lot a lot of them um, want remote it gives them better balance it's it's a more comfortable situation I think the other end of the spectrum you would say highly paid people maybe we would be the the alternative to that I think we see similar there as well so yeah I, I think I don't have any real granular sense as to the the sort of dispar the different spread across those those groups but I think um, the general stats hold pretty firmly across all um, company types. Um, here's a, a comment from Maddie. She says, working from home is great, but you don't get the same team environment feelings, hard to share ideas, network or develop new contacts, or even learn from colleagues in the same way. Um, I might jump in on that to start with, having been working remotely. I think what if you want your company to, if you want your team to buy into your agenda, you need to be very clear on what the company values and the goals are to help them buy into an idea of culture away from the physical office. Um, I've certainly started recording a lot of looms. I'm hiring two people through the Kickstarter scheme and I want them to, to learn in their own time and then come back to me with questions via Loom. But have you got any other tips that remote teams could adopt to have a sense of, of, of team culture and, and connectivity there, Chris? Yeah, I, I, think, I think the reality is it's, 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 it's maybe not worse, it's, it's different. Um, and it requires more thought and more effort, probably on all parts. Um, and I think that the second part is, it still does require time in person. So I, I think just understanding that and appreciating the time that you do have together, to really use that in a focused way to build deeper relationships like networking, like uh, understanding how someone communicates, how, how to collaborate, maybe doing more of those brainstorm type sessions on a whiteboard in person um, is the way to do it. And I think we often see remote companies having stronger bonds because of that, because when I see you, I'm going to ask about um, your kids and Peppa Pig and things like that, rather than the office where it's just, yeah, usually name daily ongoings, I guess. Well, there's nothing more inane than Peppa Pig and the parents on the call will know that. Um, 
Hazel Jane, who I know has worked in small offices with startups and has now been working remotely for the last two years, she um, says that the, the pandemic represents the worst of working, of what working from anywhere could look like because it doesn't offer any of the good stuff. I think this really needs hammered home is that everyone's experience of remote work in the last year is not reflective of all the positives that could come out from it. You know, if I want to hear, hire an Airbnb down in the Lake District and go with my family, but I can't get the time off work, I can work from there and still have that freedom. So I think as things open up, we need to encourage people to embrace some of the more social and environmental benefits of remote work. Would you agree with that, Chris? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that more. I think this has absolutely been the worst possible version of remote work. And I spend a lot of time speaking about pandemic remote versus normal remote. And pandemic remote is all those things. It's homeschooling, like I said before, it's it's not being able to travel, not being able to see friends and, and everything like that. Um, and, and being stuck at home. Um, remote work doesn't necessarily mean work from home. It means work where you are most productive, work in the situation that you produce the best work. And I think when this does start to unlock a little bit, people can travel. Maybe they don't get, like you say, time off work, but they can still spend time with their family. Maybe they wake up early in the morning and do work before they go, um, I don't know, canoeing with their family in the afternoon. So I think there's a lot of good that's going to come out of this. And I think hopefully the silver lining is people are, um, they've, they've had their eyes open to not having to go to an office every day. Absolutely. So we've got one minute on the clock and there's not any more questions coming in, just lots of people bringing their comments in. I want to talk about what companies, very quickly, what companies can be offering people now? Because the ping pong table, the unlimited beers, the gym on site um, is not going to have that same draw. So if we're thinking about the evolution of perks in the workplace, you know, unlimited holiday allowance, mental health resources, uh, there's some companies that are helping repay student loans. Um, do you feel that employers need to be embracing bespoke perks to win the war on talent? Because if my office is my desk or the coffee shop down the road, what does an employer do to draw me into their, their company? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, we, we're in the process of um, signing a contract with a $50 billion company, um, ho hopefully today, actually. Um, and, and that's an exact issue that they're facing. And I think we're helping them overcome, which is once you have people set up to work remotely, the, the desk, the chair, the peripherals, they're now as safe, comfortable and productive at home as they would be in an office. Um, what else can you give them? Is it is it swag? Is it coffee bean subscriptions? Is it Peloton bikes we, we've been asked for? Is it any number of things? And I think, yeah, really giving the individual and tailoring, tailoring it to the individual is the key here. How can we give everyone what they want and make everyone happy? And to your point, get away from just making these kids clubs with, with things people don't want. And yeah, maybe it's how can we increase people's quality of life? And I think the answer there is how can we give people as much time back as possible? That's it. And I've just dropped a, a note in the chat there from my friends at Desana who have got an app that you can just open up and find the co-working spaces near you when you're part of a membership. And I think companies that operate nationwide should be embracing things like that to actually give people the freedom to access these spaces and not leave it to themselves to find where they should work. Um, more tools like that will help people to balance this this recovery to to productivity i think um so i think we're done um chris thank you so much for your time your knowledge your expertise your patience um i, th I think a lot of your tweets and, and posts can come across very very combative combative but to understand where you're coming from with your your family life and the things that you've seen and the things that we've expressed today about all the benefits really helps to humanize the conversation a bit. Um, do you have any final tips first for businesses who are trying to navigate this and then perhaps for, for job seekers about communicating their needs going forward? Yeah, I would say for companies, it's, it's, it's about avoiding the desire to replicate the office remotely. Um, I think doing that ends up in the situation we're all facing, which is back-to-back -back Zoom meetings and probably a lot of fatigue and burnout because we're working more than we should. 
Um, for job seekers, I, I think it's it's something that that requires um, a lot of flexibility and understanding as to how things change. And I think the challenge um, people have, and I think where people can really differentiate themselves is by really focusing on building a brand for themselves. I, th I think that's always been my recommendation to anyone that's ever asked how, how to do things efficiently. And whether that's on social media, whether that's in building personal relationships with leaders and in, in other spaces, I think that's something that you can you can do very successfully in a remote world online. Um, if you're either pushing out good content or you're giving people um, help, even, even if they may not necessarily be asking for it. That's perfect. Okay, well, thank you so much, Chris. I'm just going to drop some links in the chat to where people can find out a bit more about First Base HQ. You should be hearing a little bit of Ethiopian jazz coming in to play us out. We've got a link in the chat there about uh, finding out how AAI can support you to reach talent. And also an event that we've got coming up on Thursday with Star Startup Grind Scotland about... Um, about women in the workplace and getting really, really real about that based on some of the data from a good book called uh, Invisible Women and actually the reality of being a woman in business. So there's a free link there. Chris, thank you so much. I'm gonna send around your tweets. So expect your 20K to go up by 52 um, from the people on this call today. And thank you so much for your time today, everyone. And we'll see you at the next AAI webinar. Cheers, Chris. Cheers, everyone.